Let's finish our discussion of discrete distributions by talking about two final distributions. One, a further extension of the distribution that we've talked about thus far, the multinomial distribution, and the second, a rather different kind of discrete distribution, the Poisson distribution. So recall that we extended the Bernoulli distribution into multiple trials into the binomial distribution. We're going to do the same thing with the categorical distribution by doing multiple trials from a categorical distribution to create the multinomial distribution. And so you can think about this as an analogy. The binomial distribution is to the Bernoulli distribution as the multinomial distribution is to the categorical distribution. So two examples of things you might model with a multinomial distribution are if you draw ten cards from a deck of cards, you could model the suits that you get, or the face values that you get, or the colors that you get with a multinomial distribution. Similarly, if you roll a die 50 times, you could count up how many times you get each of the different values, and that final result is modeled by a multinomial distribution. So just like how we modeled the binomial distribution with a number of trials in and a probability of success, we're going to model the multinomial distribution with a number of trials in and a vector of probabilities for each of the outcomes, just like we have for the categorical distribution. And the end result of a multinomial distribution draw is again a vector, a vector of counts. So the number of times you saw each of the individual outcomes. So for example, pretend that you threw a single die for n times. And this is a fair die, so each of the probabilities are one-sixth. And the vector that you get is the draw from the multinomial distribution. So to make this very concrete, Let's say that you throw it 10 times, and so you get 1 1, 0 2's, 3 3's, 2 4's, 1 5, and 3 6's. And so this is elaborated over here a little bit more explicitly, but we'll often just show it in this very compact form as a vector. And so each of your different outcomes has an entry, and the vector represents how many times each outcome was drawn. And we rolled the die 10 times, so this vector has to sum to 10. Another way of thinking about this is that the multinomial distribution is a joint distribution over each of the k different random variables, the number of times you see that outcome from a categorical distribution. So we've talked about what are the parameters of a multinomial distribution? And we've talked about what the outputs of a multinomial distribution are, but we want to have a probability function that describes this probability distribution. This is a little bit more complicated to produce, and we won't get into the details in this class, but I, I want to sort of walk through the intuitions about where the probability function comes from. So first, let's think about rolling a die. And we want to count up how many times various outcomes occur. How do we do that? So first, think about all the possible outcomes. If you roll a die, say, three times, there are six to the three possible outcomes. You have six possible outcomes on the first roll, six on the second, six on the third, so that's six times six times six, or six to the three. That's 216. And for a fair die, all of these possible outcomes are equal probable. So that is, the probability of rolling a 1 is equal to the probability of rolling a 6. For any given roll, it's 1 6. But when you do it three times, then you get 1 over 6 to the 3, or 1 over 216. But just like we saw for the binomial distribution, some of these outcomes if we take the perspective of counting up the number of times you see those rolls, are more likely than others. 
But what we have to do, just like with the binomial distribution, is we need to account for the number of ways the various count vectors could appear. So let's take a look at the end result that we're going to get from a multinomial distribution, a vector of counts. So let's consider a hypothetical vector where we get 1, 2, and 2 fives. What's the probability of that happening? So, to consider that, we need to consider all the ways that you could get a vector where you have a total of two fives and one two. And so, you have to get a two at some point, and the rest of them are fives. So you could either have a two in the first place, a two in the second place, or a two in the third place. To see why we don't want to do this by hand, you can take a look at a more complicated example, like one, 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 each of 3, 4, and 5, that is a much more intractable combination, and as we add more and more possibilities, this will get pretty messy to compute. And so what we can do is we can do something very similar to the binomial coefficients that we had before. So we need to have a term that basically counts up all of the different ways that we can see the count vector in our distribution. So what this term does is tells us if we're going to sample n things and we have each of various counts that we're going to see in each of the positions, how many different ways can we rearrange that? So again, this is coming out of the branch of mathematics called combinatorics. Play around with this number and you can get a sense of why this works out correctly, just to give you a, a, a little bit of intuition about it, the total number up here is the total number of ways that you can arrange an in-length sequence. And then from that, we're going to remove or divide out each of the counts of the individual outcomes. And so, think about it this way. Let's say that you have n trials, but all of those trials are going to be concentrated in a single outcome. Let's say that we're rolling a die, and that outcome is 6. And so, in that case, this turns into 6 factorial over 1 factorial, 1 factorial, and so on, up to 6 factorial. And so, this basically cancels out, and it just becomes 1. And so, if all of your vector of counts is going to be concentrated in a single outcome, then you're not double counting anything. Things get more complicated if you mix it up. Let's say that you're going to have 6 trials, as before, but each of the possible outcomes will happen once. And so then you have 6 factorial over 1 factorial, 1 factorial, and so on. All of them are 1 factorial, which is just 1. So all of those don't matter, and you're just left with 6 factorial. Okay, so 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So that's 2 times 12, 24 which is times 6 times 5 times 30 is 720. So, you have 720 ways of getting each of the 6 possible outcomes in some order. And then things in between, you'll have fewer combinations, more things will cancel out. Okay, so that is the first term of the multinomial distribution as we saw before in the binomial distribution. The second term is just a categorical distribution repeated over and over again. So here you have the probability of the kth outcome happening, and then you raise that to the number of times it happened, i.e. that entry in your outcome vector. So this makes sense. You have some probability of each of the k events occurring, 
And if it occurred, then you take that probability and you add it to the product. So essentially what you're doing is in this product, for each of the events that occur, you're going to take the probability of the event and multiply it to include that count. Okay, so that's a very brief introduction to the multinomial distribution. It is the extension of the categorical distribution in the same way that the binomial distribution was an extension of the Bernoulli distribution. One thing to keep in mind is that the categorical distribution is independent. But think about for a second whether the individual entries in a multinomial distribution are independent. So think about that. Pause the video. Okay, so are they independent? Even though the individual categorical draws are independent, the entries in the multinomial distribution vector are not independent because those entries have to sum to the number of trials. So again, remember the analogy. The binomial distribution is to the Bernoulli distribution as the multinomial distribution is to the categorical distribution. So to conclude our discussion of categorical distributions, let's talk about something a little bit different. Let's talk about the Poisson distribution. So the Poisson distribution measures the number of times something has occurred. This is used to model things like the number of pieces of mail you received in a day, the number of goals scored in a football game, things like that. And this is a very simple distribution in terms of its parameterization. Its parameter is called the mean. So it has one parameter. This parameter corresponds to the expected number of events you're going to see. But because the outcome space of a Poisson random variable is all of the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it is a distribution over a very large number of things. Because no matter what the probability is, there's always some probability of having one more, and this just keeps going on out to infinity. And eventually the probabilities of seeing those things will be very small, but they will never get completely to zero. So now let's take a look at the probability mass function of the Poisson distribution. So this takes the mean parameter, which we'll represent with the Greek letter lambda, and for computing the probability that you'll see x of the thing that you're looking for, you raise lambda to that x, and then you multiply that by e to the negative lambda. And then finally, you'll divide by x factorial. So this is very hard to think about abstractly because there are some somewhat unfamiliar mathematical functions here. So you have e to the negative lambda, you have lambda to the x, and then all of that is divided by x factorial. So it's hard to put these various functions together. So this is where a computer can be really helpful. Let's take a look at some of the distributions that you get for different parameters lambda. And so recall that the Poisson distribution only has a single parameter lambda. And lambda is the expected number of outcomes that you expect to see. So if lambda is 1, you have a distribution that falls off very quickly. And so it peaks for 0 and 1, and so it, it has a probability of around 0.37 for those two values, and then it quickly goes down to 0. If lambda is 4, you expect to see 4 events. And so here you have the probability distribution ramping up between 0 and 3, like so. And then it plateaus for the values of 3 and 4, and then it goes down to 0. If lambda is 10, you see something similar. It ramps up a little bit more slowly, and then it averages, and, and then it plateaus around 10, and then goes back down to 0. So at this point, you're seeing more of a bell-shaped distribution. Keep this in mind later when we start talking about the normal distribution. Now that you've seen it visually, let's put in some numbers so that you get a more mathematical intuition of what the Poisson distribution is doing. 
Okay, so now that we have seen this visually, let's put in some numbers to get a more mathematical intuition of what's going on. So let's say that your parameter is lambda equals 2.5. Let's plug that in to, say, the probability of the number of events occurring is 3. So you take 2.5 and you raise that to the third power. That gives you 15.6. Then you multiply that by e to the negative 2.5, and then you divide that by 3 factorial, which gives you 6. So e to the negative 2.5 is around 0.1, and so you're multiplying that by 15.6, and then dividing that by 6. So that is, so that's around 1.5 divided by 6, and so that gives us something around a quarter or a little bit less. And so this is how you compute the probability of a Poisson distribution. And one of the things I like about the Poisson distribution is that it's very useful. It's able to model a lot of phenomenon with relatively good accuracy, and it also connects up with the normal distribution that we'll be seeing very soon. We'll be talking about continuous distributions very soon, and we'll also see other categorical or discrete distributions throughout the class, but this serves as an introduction to the kinds of things that you'll be seeing. So this wraps up our discussion of discrete distributions. Next, we'll be talking about continuous distributions. And throughout the course, we'll be seeing a variety of new distributions that combine the concepts that we've talked about here with other things we'll be seeing later in the course. So this is, again, very important to the foundations of data science that we'll be using throughout the semester.